Okay, uh, hi and welcome. In this next section, we'll be talking about motion uh, in the simplest form, uh, topics of displacement and uh, velocity and such like that. Uh, we also get into the idea of vectors and how we use vectors um, in the simplest kind of way as we kind of build on that and go forward. Okay, in this class, we'll be studying uh, four different types of motion. Uh, motion is one of our primary objectives uh, in this class. Um, so the uh, types of motions and the reasons which we'll get to with forces. The four types that we will study. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about straight line motion. This could be uh, anything kind of right to left, you know, or up and down. Um, you know, something like that, some kind of straight line that is going to uh, happen either x and uh, across x or across y. We'll get into some details here in this presentation. Uh, later chapters, we'll look at projectile motion, talking about two dimensions, so something that goes up vertically and down, um, and then as it's going, it's also moving horizontally. And some of you all could probably already look at this and see what this kind of looks like, uh, especially mathematically. <clears throat> uh, after that, we'll talk about circular motion. Uh, basically, you have something like uh, people going around a track, right? So if it's a circular track, and that's not a circle, but you get the idea, uh, they leave at one point here, and then they travel in a circle, like as if they're pivoting around one point. Or you could think about, uh, you know, the outside part of a wheel as it turns around. Um, the last part is uh, rotational motion. Rotational motion is like this, like a top. If I was to look at the top from the beginning, to from the top, uh, from the from the above, uh, I would notice that it has some kind of spin to it, and that's really what we're talking about. Some kind of rigid object that spins, uh, and these are the four types of motion that we'll be talking about in this um, in this class. Okay, we'll start off by talking about motion itself and specifically tracking motion. Um, you know, the idea is if I had um, a series of snapshots that I could view something going on, let's say this is at one second, and this is at two seconds, and this is at three, <clears throat> three seconds, and this is at four seconds, uh, as I look at the picture that's going on, um, I see there's a difference, right? There's a difference in this, uh, in this car's position, right? There's some kind of motion uh, from this car in each one of those positions. Uh, so each frame that I see represents a specific uh, uh, instant of time, and that time is equally spaced. So if I had this, it would be one second that's equally spaced. I could have made this, you know, half, you know, one half second, one second, one half second, one second, one and a half, and two. The idea is that as long as I equally space them, I can get a good idea of of motion. Uh, from a series of snapshots. I mean, you got to remember our eyes themselves only work at about 15 frames per second or 30 frames per second. Um, so, I mean, anything, we basically sense a series of snapshots just, uh, it's pretty quick at 15, 30 frames per second, I think, in that range. But um, for the most part, uh, things happen in between that we don't notice, and we just have to interpolate the difference. If we put all those uh, individual frames together, we can actually get a snapshot. So remember this was, uh, what we said is that this one was one second, and this one was two seconds, and this one was three seconds, and this one's four seconds. Uh, put all those together and I can get one kind of continuous frame. Um, one thing I can do is actually I can now look at this. I can now get a um, an idea of the motion of the object by looking at the spacing between the snapshots, right? So from here to here, what's that spacing? Well, I can look at that and say, okay, it's from here to here, it's, it's this much, right? Well, what about this much? Uh, what about the next time? Well, it's that much spacing. Uh, and then next time, okay? And by looking at the spacing here, here, and here, I can get an idea of what the vehicle, what the person, what the whatever object is. Uh, doing. And this is setting up uh, um, something that are useful conceptually as in, uh, in motion diagrams. Uh, as an alternate representation of motion, we will have 
you know, graphs, we'll have equations, we'll have whatever, but we can also have these motion diagrams to help us along. Okay, if we follow the previous um, slides and talk about uh, motion diagrams having equal spacing and time, we can have different scenarios that we can interpret out of those. Um, the first one, if I look at the person on the skateboard, the man on the skateboard here, um, if I look at this, uh, what can I say about the spacing? Um, well, I have the idea that there's, you know, from here to here, a certain amount of space, and then a certain amount of space here, and a certain amount of space here. Um, those look pretty equal to me, as in spacing between them. It doesn't look like he uh, is changing. So what we say that if it has an equally spaced, that means there's some kind of constant speed going on. You know, every second, you know, he's covering the same amount of distance, right? So there's some kind of constant speed going on between this, okay? Uh, um, against that is the images that have increasing spacing, right? Indicate the object is speeding up. So if this is taken every second, right, every second, um, the distance between here and here, right, between this uh, this time, t, you know, time zero, if you want to make that, or let's say like we had before, one second, you know, two seconds, three seconds, and four seconds, right, this, this spacing right here is, is low, right, or uh, distance is low here, and that same one second, right, because these snapshots a second, I have more space, and in here I have even more space, okay? So the idea is that um, this person is covering more space, right, each, uh, every second. So essentially they are speeding up. Uh, and again, against that even, you have the idea of a decrease in spacing. So this, this thing was, this car was covering uh, this much space originally every second, and then uh, it covers this much, which uh, that's pretty similar. But definitely right here, uh, that car is now only covering you know, this much space in a second. So there has to be some kind of slowing down or decrease in speed. Now this is usually where I can flaunt my artistic you know, uh, capabilities and say that I can draw anything in the world. And this is true because I draw things to the particle model, right? Um, you know, cars, people, you know, other objects, rocks, you know, people, cars, whatever. Uh, they're complex, right? Uh, they're made of multiple moving objects, especially a person, something else like that. Um, they're complex, but the idea is that we can represent and we can consolidate, you know, call it complex objects to a single point or a single particle. Right, so here, you know, I got rock falling. Right, well, I can actually represent that rock by putting, you know, a single dot basically at the center of mass right here. Right, and so, um, okay, I can represent that whole rock as whatever's coming from that center of mass. Um, same thing, you know, as I go down, um, I can represent this person as a dot here at the center of mass, dot here at the center of mass, here, here, and here. Um, but eventually I get tired of drawing rocks and people, so I just draw little dots, right? And that dot represents the particle, uh, basically a particle that's at the center of mass. And I'm okay with that. It's a particle model, and that's okay. <coughs> and the one thing you have to keep track of, though, is what we have here. The point must consistently represent a particular part of the object. So if I say here, right, I can represent this complex car with a single dot. By the way, this kind of looks like an Audi TT or something like that. I don't know what kind of car this is, but I can represent this complex car with a single dot, right? So I can say dot right there. You can see how it tracks down. So right here, I represent the entire car by putting a dot right there. I gotta keep that dot in that same relative position, right? I can't, on the next, you know, thing I say oh, okay that's my dot here and that's not that's not right because that doesn't keep track of the motion I have to keep it in the same spot the entire time so roughly about here roughly about here roughly about there right and of course all of that you know works out right so these dots that are here represent you know my car 
you know, in the best way possible. Now that we've talked about uh, objects and their, you know, just kind of general motion of constant speed, speeding up, slowing down, let's talk about the coordinates at which they'll travel. Um, there's multiple coordinate systems, of course. You have the one that we'll start off with is nice and easy, one-dimensional, right? One-dimensional, just going right or left or up and down or something like that, okay? Um, so that's one-dimensional motion. Uh, eventually, we will be getting to, in the following chapters, we'll be getting to this right here. This is two-dimensional motion. We have both X and Y. So something may be going from this point and then traveling like this to some other point. It's traveling both in X and in Y. Um, for those who are bound for uh, engineering physics or any kind of calculus in the future, you'll be dealing heavily with uh, three dimensions. Right, X, Y, and Z. And the idea is that there's some kind of, you know, if I, you know, put a, um, put a dot out here that actually has an X, Y, and Z coordinate, I could, you know, basically have a something that projects down. It goes into my X and Y, and it's on Z. It's a little bit complicated, and we're not even covering it in this class, so I don't know why I'm necessarily dealing with it and talking about it now. So, get rid of this. So as we think about one-dimensional motion, we're really going to think about our good old-fashioned, you know, middle school, or I don't know when you start learning this, but the, the number line, right? You have some position here that is your origin, okay? Some position here is your origin. Um, all the numbers to the right have an increasing value, right? All the numbers to the left have a decreasing um, if we set our you know, origin to be zero, essentially all numbers to the right have positive values. All numbers to the left have negative values. Okay? Um, so, you know, the highlight here is that you've got right is positive, left is negative. Okay? So if I say something's moving to the right, you know, that's going to have a positive value to it. If it's moving to the left, it's going to have a negative value. And this also applies that we'll use for, you know, um, east and west. Okay, so if something's... This is just a convention that we use. There's no Mother Nature telling us that east is positive and west is negative. It's just a convention that we use. Um... And um, so anytime we go east, we say something's heading east, we say it, give it a positive value. If we had say it's going west, we give it a negative value. Uh, and if you remember that, uh, so we can have, uh, this happens to be x, right, across the x-axis right here. Um, but you could easily have the same thing going on with the y, right? You have some kind of zero origin. Uh, you go up. You have positive 1, positive 2, positive 3, so on. Uh, you go down, you have negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Okay, um, so in this case, up, positive, down, negative. So we're going to follow those general rules. Uh, again, and likewise, this can also mean up north as a convention and down south as a convention being negative. And the reason we set this up, um, you know, we take that and steal that number line, that idea from from math is, is pretty apparent when you... Um, when you call your 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 mom or your dad or somebody like other you know on on the you know and they're on the highway, let's say they're on ninety eight right on ninety eight or Hardy or something like that, you know you call them you ask them where they are they say I'm on ninety eight I say okay that doesn't tell me anything where are you, well I'm on ninety eight and I am two miles east of Chick fil A oh that tells me something else, okay and east or west I have to have some kind of reference point. 
And so what really what uh, the coordinate system is used uh, to provide a frame of reference. And we set something as an origin. And so we say something like, where do you live relative to your friend's house? So we have this picture here. Essentially what we're doing is setting your friend's house as a origin. Right? If I set this as an origin, and let's just say this is, you know, a nice um, world. Let's say like, you know, this way is east, right? Um, this way is west, right? Nice and convenient. So if I say, where do you live relative to your friend's house? So now I just say that my friend's house is the origin, right? And so if I go, how many units do I go to the right or to the east? I say, okay, 2.1 miles. So 2.1 miles east of my friend's house, right? Um, but if I said, where do I live relative to the grocery store? Oh, different story, right? I have a new origin because it's new, it's relative, relative to something else, okay? So now if this is my origin, I still get the idea that this is east, this is west, Right, so I say, okay, well, I live 4.3 miles west, right, 4.3 miles west of uh, the grocery store, right? It doesn't mean my house has changed. It doesn't mean my house has moved when I change that point of reference. It just means that my reference point is new, and I have to report it reference to something else. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, Einstein said, which is pretty... Amazing once you get everything to it. We're free to set anything as a point of reference. Um, and we'll get into more detail about that. Um, but, you know, that's going to establish some kind of sense of position. Okay? And that position will report as X. That's our first variable we will use. We've now learned our first variable, which is X. Right? So X means position at any particular instant. Uh, that is a position. So we'll be using X for, you know, for a long time. Uh, we can also adjust our coordinate system. Um, what we talked about previously was pretty obvious was uh, this one here and this one here. That I can have a right to left, um, a right to left style uh, coordinate system here. And that's easy. It's one dimension. It's, you know, it's along the X axis in this case. No problems. I can have an up and down coordinate system here. Um, and that's, again, one dimension that's along the y-axis. No problem. But I can actually tilt. This is where it gets a little complicated. We'll have something like this on ramps. Or I can tilt. And it's easier for us, for us just to think of down the hill, you know, being in the x. Right? And essentially what we do when we do that is we, we take something like... Um, something like this, a, a coordinate system that was originally like this, X and Y, and we rotate it. We'll actually rotate it kind of like this way, right? And eventually, we say we just tilt it down like this. We'll have X and Y. Uh, we may not even need Y, but um, the idea is that uh, we're gonna t we can tilt our X axis, or tilt our axis to suit what we need, okay? And there's nothing breaking the laws with that as long as we keep track of everything um, everything else. And we'll have particular problems that we'll go through on that. Okay, now that we've talked about positions relative to uh, a coordinate system or some kind of origin, uh, let's talk about changing of that position. Uh, because not everything stands still. Then some things move, right? So it can change positions. Um, there's two different ways that we can look at that change in position. One is displacement, and the other one is distance. Okay, um, And uh, the definitions that we have here are important. This is one of our first sticky vocabulary parts, where we have to get this right when we say it, or when, when I ask a question, I'm looking for a very specific answer. Um, distance is the length of the complete path of motion. Okay, If I look at this, here, you leave the cabin and you go to the lake. Okay, it's easy enough, but there could be multiple paths. Okay, that's path one, path two, round the lake, you take your time, and you get there. Each one has a different distance that is covered. Okay, 
It looks to me that path one seems to be a shorter distance to the lake. Path two seems much further around. You've got to go walk all the way around the lake uh, to get there. Okay, so one has a greater distance than the other, path one or path two. All right, the complete path of motion. Um, so what are some things in everyday life that depend on or measure, that measure distance? Um, well, you're in your car, you have an odometer that keeps track of how far your car has gone, right? The complete path that your car has taken since it left the dealership, uh, you know, at you know, zero miles uh, way back when, okay? So that's distance. This is what we're familiar with. We're, we're okay with this. Yeah, we're okay with this, okay? Uh, the one, the next one, though, is we have to get our minds into displacement a lot of times in, in this class when we talk about motion. Displacement specifically is the difference between the final and initial position. The difference between the final and initial position. So I don't care what you did in between. I don't care. I don't care all the stuff, the path and whatever. I say, where did you end up? Right here. Okay. Next part, where did you start? Right here. All right is the difference between. So this path right here essentially is the displacement. Where did you end up versus where you started, right? That is your displacement, okay? Uh, otherwise known in kind of country talk is as the crow flies, you know. You know, getting from here to, uh, to USM as the crow flies is not that big of a deal, right? But actually getting on 98 and kind of, you know, going through traffic and going through whatever, you know, maybe you have to go take, you know, some kind of side road or fourth, whatever. Um, then it gets a little bit, you know, a longer trip, right? But as the crow flies, uh, or the talking about displacement, all I care about, I don't care what you do in between, it's just where you ended up versus where you started. So this brings up some interesting things. Um, you know, if we talk about here, like a track, here we got a track, all right? So, you know, um, First of all, we can think of mail. Okay, runner A starts here, right? Uh, takes one complete lap around the track, I think about 400 meters, right? If I'm talking distance, and I say what distance has that uh, runner traveled, well, that's easy, 400 meters. You, uh, we just said that, it covered 400 meters, right? All the way around the track, it's a 400 meter track, no big, no big deal. Uh, but if I said displacement, okay, this is something different. I don't care what the runner did in between. I just said, what's their final position minus their initial position? Well, their final position is right here, right? Right back at the starting line, which is now the finish line. And their initial position is right there also, okay? So essentially, you know, if I looked at that, then they haven't moved. They have zero displacement. Right? There's nothing that they've done to change their position. Right? Their, you know, the uh, difference between their final position their, and initial position is zero. All right? No displacement. So this brings up some interesting things. You know, the idea of uh, you go to a NASCAR race, you want to see uh, Daytona 500, or Talladega, whatever. Daytona 500, that's, you know, 500... 500, 500 miles it's traveled, right? Well, that's 500 miles of distance, but the actual displacement of the vehicles, of the cars, is zero, right? The start line, finish line, about the same, right? So they actually have zero displacement, but they can be traveling 500 miles. Um, you know, you could find the values in between. You could find, well, what if you only went halfway around the track? Well, you'd have to know you know, something like the circumference or something, be half of the circumference or something to find some kind of displacement that goes on. But either way, you always have to keep track of these two words because the answer for distance is often different from displacement. Okay, in the last, in the last slide we had an example. Your car... Um, measures distance, right? It does not measure displacement. You cannot return your car back to the dealership which you bought it, you know, five, ten years later and say, here you go. It has zero miles on it um, because you say, oh, zero displacement. It's back at the same dealership, back where it started, zero displacement. But the reality is it's gone, you know, you know 30,000 miles, 50,000 miles, 100,000 miles. 
So now we have our formal definition of displacement, as in its mathematical definition to go along with the, the other one. Uh, displacement is measured in SI units and meters, okay, so uh, it's, a, it's a kind of distance type measurement, so it's, so it's meters is what we use, okay, and it is um, uh, found by subtracting the initial position from the, the final position, or another way to say is the final position minus the initial position. You remember, um, so delta, right? Delta always means change, and specifically, mathematically, always means final minus initial. So a change in position is what we have here. X signifies position, delta means change, so this means change in position. That change in position is always final minus initial. Right? And if I know where my final position is on the number line, I know where my initial position is on the number line, then I can find the difference in between, which is the displacement. Okay, so let's play around with our um, scenario that we had earlier. Um, let's make up a uh, story here. Uh, you travel from your house to the grocery store, pick up some snacks. Afterwards, you travel to your friend's house for an all-night Netflix marathon. Uh, what was your displacement? What was your distance? First, we'll concentrate on the second question, distance. What's your distance traveled? Well, it says um, you went from your, your house. Uh, so actually, that's probably the best thing to set as our origin. So here's our origin right here. That's our zero. Okay. Um, so the question is, what's your distance? I went from here to the grocery store, All right? And that's uh, 4.3 miles, All right? Got some snacks. And then I went from the grocery store all the way back to your friend's house. So what's that distance? Well, when you come back, it's 4.3 miles back to your house. And then an additional 2.1 miles to your friend's house. So that's going to be 6.4 miles. Okay? So what is my entire distance travel? That is my entire path length. I have to consider the second that I lift, left the house to the grocery store and then back to a friend's house, that entire path length. So it's going to be 6.4 plus 4.3. All right, so that will be 10 point seven uh, ten point seven miles that is my entire distance that is traveled right that'll always be a positive number it can't be a negative number um, and it will always be it can never be less than your displacement okay um, next question or first question here is what is your displacement now displacement i got to think, change my thinking. In order to change it, I'm going to go ahead and just erase what I have here. All right? Change my thinking. Oh, erase my origin, which I probably didn't need to do. But here I go, and I say, here's my origin right here. Okay, same thing as before. I said, um, when I think about displacement, I go, what is my final position? Well, my final position is at my friend's house on the couch, eating snacks. My initial position, where'd you start from? Well, I started at my house, right here. Okay. Okay, and then what's your displacement? It's the, it's the, the difference between those two. Well, um, here, I, I was here at uh, my house and ended up there. So I ended up basically 2.1 mile, miles to the west. 2.1 miles to the west, okay? And that is my displacement. Let's say um, that this, you know, this was east and this was, oops, east and this was west. Okay. Now, uh, I think a few slides back we said, well, we can set anything as the origin. So let's play around with that. Let's play around with that. What if I set 
as the picture told us to in a way. What if I set um, this right here? What if I set the uh, your friend's house as the origin? Okay, let's play around with that. Well, one, it would, wouldn't tra change the distance traveled, right? It'll still be traveling um, 4.3 miles, right? 4.3 miles and then back all the way, right? This would not change. But let's see if this would change, right? So, um, so let's get our, our mathematics out and, um, and look at this, okay? Um, so what we want to do is, um, oops, got some dots there those out of the way. Uh, so what I'm going to do is look at this and say, okay, um, so it's my displacement, delta x, equals my final position minus my initial position. All right, so I say relative to this as an origin, what is my final position? Uh, well, my final position is at the origin, so or is at zero position. So that is zero. That's where I end up. My initial position. All right, where did I start off? Well, I started off at my house right here. All right? Where is that right there? That is 2.1 miles. If this was a number line, all these numbers are negative, all these numbers were positive. Basically, my number would be 2.1 miles away. So what's my displacement? My displacement is negative 2.1 miles, okay? You remember negative for us, in this case, if we're talking about this is really east and this is west, that's just kind of a handy thing that we actually use in everyday life. So this is the same thing as 2.1 miles west. And it didn't matter in this case. And in all cases, it didn't matter if I set my house as the origin or if I set your house as the origin. Okay, now that we've talked about motion itself uh, in forms of displacement and distance, uh, let's talk about the rate at which that motion can happen. Um, first, we're going to keep it as simple as we can, and we're only going to talk about a uniform motion. Okay, uniform motion means that um, when the object's traveling, uh, and is uh, not speeding up or slowing down, right? So it's not speeding up or slowing down. It is uniform in its motion, right? Anytime you have uniform motion, that means that your you know separations here are always the same in your in your graphs or your you know your motion uh, your motion diagrams. Right? In this case, not uniform. There is a speeding up that is happening in this in this figure right here. Um, it doesn't matter how fast it's going, right? So, you know, this one, um, so you have two objects here, the car and the bicycle. Uh, so you got to look at, okay, which one? Uh, they have the same intervals of zero seconds, one second, two seconds, three seconds. You know, which one is having, you know, the faster speed or something like that? Um, and we can look at that and kind of figure that out. The idea is that this car is traveling, you know, faster because it's, well, one, it's a car, and you can't expect that, but the uh, it's covering more distance for every interval of time, all right? Um, but this is, you know, basically uniform motion. No speeding up, no slowing down. All of these intervals are the same, right? All of these intervals are the same. This is not uniform motion. So in a complete parallel to... Uh, our understanding of uh, displacement and distance, we now have a new terms when we talk about rate at which something travels. We have both speed um, and velocity. Um, and uh, this is something that is completely parallels distance and, um, and displacement. So first of all, let's talk about something we're a little bit more you know, used to, and that's average speed. Right, uh, in my initial notes, I forgot to you know put the word average there. But average speed is the length of the complete path of motion. Remember, complete path of motion, right? Complete path of motion is is distance, okay? In a certain time divided by the amount of time. And I put a little asterisk here, and I said, oh, by the way, we'll use the word speed 
uh, slightly differently a little bit later on. Okay, but for now we're we'll talking about average speed is the distance traveled, which is the complete path in motion, right? Com that's the distance divided by the amount of time, right? So your car, right, doesn't care. Uh, I'm sorry, it does care, right? You know, if you're swerving back and forth around some kind of country road like this, right, it's at all times, or you could find an average speed for that trip, right, by this entire distance, this entire path, right, divided by the time it takes, right? So that is, you could find some kind of average speed it took you to get from, you know, this part of, you know, this to another part by taking this entire path, okay? And that is an average speed. Okay, now if we talk about units here, what's distance traveled, our SI unit is meters. Um, time interval, our SI unit is seconds. So we're talking about meters per second for a unit, right? And you can see down here it's the same, whether we're talking about velocity or speed. But speed is really something that we use. That's, that's really what we use the most, right? is how fast you're going. You know, we use miles per hour, but still it's the same thing. How fast are you going? Uh, you compare, you, you care about the uh, complete path length. Okay. Velocity, on the other hand, is the difference between the final and the initial position. That sounds familiar. What is that? Difference between final and initial position, well, that's displacement. Okay. In a certain interval time uh, divided by the time interval. Okay, so how much displacement do I undergo and how, in what time interval? Okay, so um, velocity equals displacement divided by time interval. And really what we're talking about here is an average velocity. Um, and uh, also the same units, meters for displacement, um, seconds for time. So if I put this, okay, uh, displacement, delta x from our previous slides is um, a final position minus initial position, or x's position, uh, time, or change in time, or time interval, is delta t, final time minus initial time. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you that most of the time, um, you know, this just gets written as t, right? Uh, we say, you know, basically the initial time, we say that's when we start our clock at time zero, but we could say, between time, you know, time, you know, three seconds and two seconds or something. And that interval is now between three seconds and two seconds is just one second. So um, there are different ways. But for the most part, we, I'll just go ahead and tell you that this delta t, this delta on the t tends to get dropped. Okay, so average speed, this is what your speedometer reads, speedometer, right, it reads your speed. Now, velocity, though, is a little bit different because velocity is looking for its final position minus initial position, right? So if this is some racetrack that you did over and over again, um, right? Your average speed would be the complete path length divided by the time, right? The, av the average uh, velocity would be different. All I care is about the displacement that you undergo from your final position, from your initial position, and how much time it took. So you could think about which one would be greater, the, the velocity or the speed, as in the number value. All right. Well, speed has this entire path that it has to think about, so it's going to look like it's slower in, in the way it is. In the velocity, though, final position minus initial position, as the crow flies, you know, a shorter um, distance in, in meters. Uh, for the same time interval, will look faster in this case, right? Um, oh, actually, I did get that back backwards. You see, the displacement is uh, is less than uh, than that for that time interval. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. The velocity will look uh, s uh, slower than the speed. So we can also compare speed and velocity in this case here. Uh, we have two bikes uh, moving. And if I look at my motion diagrams, um, I see equal spacing for each bike. 
Okay, that's good. That means we're talking about uniform motion. We're not talking about anything that's speeding up or slowing down. So the question is, which bike is moving faster? Oh, okay, so uh, these intervals look pretty much the same. You know, going right to left and left to right. All right, so um, I'm not sure that really helps me much. Um, it looks like bike one starts all the way here at the left, right, and then goes to the right at equal kind of pace. I could even calculate that if I wanted to. I could say that's 20, 20 feet per one second, so 20 feet per second. What about bike two? Bike two goes, uh, for every one second, it goes 20 meters, but it goes in this way. So essentially what we're saying is that this one has a, um, this one has a speed, oh sorry, uh, sorry, has a velocity of, <coughs> of 20 meters per second to the right, so we'll make that positive. Right. This one though has a velocity of 20 meters per second to the left. But let's look back, you know, which one's moving faster? It's kind of like our Dorothy and Toto example uh, that we will do in class. It depends. It depends on what you're looking at. I mean, is one value larger than the other? Kind of yes, kind of no. All right? So if I look, and I want to talk to you about just how fast, how fast it's going. What's the speedometer of the bike reading, if there was a speedometer? Both of them would be reading 20. Right? And that's what a speed is. Speed does not care about this. Okay? Speed does not care about the sign or the direction. Right? So speed measures only how fast the object moves. But velocity, right? Velocity tells us this right here. Velocity tells us both the object's speed and and the direction. Okay? So velocity tells us the speed, and it tells us the direction, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. Okay, and that's the difference between speed and velocity. This is all our, our alternative direct, uh, definition. So to speed, and this is, you know, I said earlier that, you know, there's an alternative definition. And the idea is that if I have something speed, I can actually... Um, sorry, if I have something's velocity, I can get its speed at that time too. I just take away, you know, the direction, and that is its speed. Uh, if you're going 36, you know, miles per hour to the east, and I say, hey, what's your speed? Think about what's your speedometer reading, speedometer reading. It's reading 36, right? It's not reading 36 you know, east or west or any kind of direction like that. It's just reading that. So that is what speed uh, reflects. And this is a reason that we'll get into when we talk about this next section. Okay, that leads us into scalars versus vectors. Okay, uh, We've been kind of uh, going on without this discussion for now just to get us introduced. But now it's time to tackle this. Okay, First of all, we have things that are numbers or values that are called scalars. Now, scalars are physical quantities that can be described by a single number. Okay, they don't need, you don't need to remind you that it's positive or that it's negative. Um, it doesn't need anything like that. It doesn't mean east and west or up and down. It's just a number and there's nothing you can get around. Uh, easiest examples like mass, right? You go weigh something. You can't get a negative mass. You can't get a mass to the east. You can't get, you know, mass up or whatever. It's just a number, you know, just, yeah, there's a unit to it, but it's two kilograms. You know, it's not two kilograms north or anything else like that. Uh, Energy is the same way. Time. Time only has one direction. Right, forward, I guess, you know, but there's no backwards, just time. Temperature, right? Yeah, you can have positive and negative temperature, but there's not really a direction to it, especially if we're talking about Kelvin, right, where everything's based off of absolute zero. 
speed is one of those things. Speed, your speedometer reads 30 miles per hour. It never reads negative 30 miles per hour or 30 miles per hour east. It always just reads 30 miles per hour or however fast you're going, probably on 98, going insanely fast. Um, but vectors, on the other hand, vectors are physical quantities that describe by both a magnitude or size and a direction. So by, you know, which way is it going by how much, right? Magnitude is how much, direction is which way. Um, a magnitude of a vector can be positive or negative, but it can never be zero. So we have some examples that we'll be using in this class. One is displacement. We already looked at that, right? I can have positive, I can have negative, I can have east, I can have west, I can have up, I can have down. I, you know, I have all these different ways, right? On this, on this side, though, distance, you can't go a negative distance. Right? You, you you can't go, I went negative two, you know, miles to work. Right? That that's you know, it doesn't make any sense. But I could say I went two miles west, and that's a displacement. Okay. So um that's different. So velocity is another one. It needs a magnitude and a direction. So it needs a magnitude and a direction. Uh these other ones, acceleration, force, momentum, uh fields, all that kind of stuff we'll talk about later. But essentially we're starting to get this idea that we need to break down, you know, our understanding of things into something that's either scalars or vectors. One of the easier way to start thinking about vectors is using visual representations. Okay. You know, arrows uh is our visual representation. Um, so we draw arrows, right, to represent vectors. Basically, there are, here's, here are some vectors right here, we'll say, you know, whatever. They represent different things, okay? Um, and that's our graphical representation. Uh, so what we say is that the length of the arrow is the magnitude. By how much is it? Okay, um, so... Essentially, if I want a, to represent something that's, you know, 3,000 meters, I'm going to have a long arrow to represent that. If something's 3 meters, I may have just a little short arrow, right? But my arrow represents basically the size of that value. The bigger the value is, the bigger the arrow, okay? Um, on the other hand, oh, sorry, uh, to go with that, you have um, the direction of the arrow, right? The direction points in the direction of the vector. Uh, basically, the orientation of the arrow, arrow is a direction. So if I had a displacement like I had in the last thing, and said, okay, that displacement was um, three meters, this is just three meters east. Okay, this length right here means the magnitude. This basically, this length right here means three meters. The east is represented by, you know, basically the arrow, right? The idea that there's the, you know, pointy ends over here. Okay, so all of these, this one has some kind of direction that's going off this way. If you think about displacement or speed, um, this could be like a. Imagine this is a, a billiard ball table or pool ball table or something, and all these. You know, pull balls are going off in different directions. Each one represented by a different uh, velocity vector, right? So basically, the longer the vector, the higher the speed or how fast it's going. And then the direction of the arrow tells you in what direction is it going, okay? Now, when we actually represent these, uh, we use these little top arrows, Okay. So things that have that are vectors. We just kind of get in the habit of reading those and say, oh, yeah, that's a vector. Eventually we'll know what vectors are, you know, or not. Force, you know, velocity, um, displacement stuff, and then, you know, um, actually I don't even know what that is. is but um, so, uh, but we'll, we'll be using vectors quite a bit. And, and the best way to start representing them is with the,
these arrows. So let's start, first start talking about displacement, uh, I'm sorry, vectors as they relate to displacement, the first topic we talked about. Um, displacement vectors are always drawn from the object's starting position to the final position. So here's the starting position of this boat. Here's the final position right here. You can kind of see the wake that was created by the boat in the picture, right? And so we draw a displacement vector from, from the uh, initial position to the final position. Now we usually call the um, this in you know the starting position. This is usually our um, what we call the, the tail of the vector, right? So uh, so we have a tail back here, and then we have a tip. This is where the arrow, you know, the pointy end down here go, kind of goes, right? So we have tail and we have tip. So we always put the tail at the starting position and the tip at the ending position, right? So we can, you know, if Jane started here, uh, let's say this is a street, whatever, so she's not Superman or Superwoman, she didn't, like, fly over that way. Uh, so she really went this way, right? But the idea is that we're going to represent her displacement, final position, minus initial position, using this uh, vector right here, right? So I represent it by saying starting here and going off like right there, right? So I say the displacement for Jane, and then you could say delta x for Jane, same thing, and this is using d for, for that, and that's okay, um, is 100 feet. That's the length of this, 100 feet. Right, and then it has a direction. 30 degrees east of north is that direction. So here's north. Oops. Uh, so here's north, and like right here, and then, oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, so 30 degrees east of north. And we'll practice that a little bit better. Um, and let's see, so that's James. But uh, Sam, though, he started here ended here, so I'll go from the start to the finish, put on my arrow there, they have to have arrows, um, and so what do I report Sam's, I say it's 100 feet, it's the same length, this one, this one is the same length as that one right here, these are the same length, uh, but this one's due east, right, uh, if I didn't give east and west, and this wasn't something like a street city block or something like that, I could just say, you know, this is positive, you know, positive 100, um, positive 100 feet, and then this is something else. Yeah. So let's look at this example. Um, we're going to start talking about adding vectors, right? So I said, okay, I can represent vectors, you know, like this and whatever, whatever direction, doesn't matter. Uh, but let's start adding vectors. So Anna walks 90 meters due east, right? That's one vector. 90 meters. It goes this way. So let's say due east. Okay? Uh, and then she walks another 50, so I'll say plus, 50 meters. Yeah, it's a little bit too long, plus 50 meters to the east. All right, I don't need any fancy graphical representation. I get the idea that uh, Anna, she went 140 meters, and guess what, to the east. All right, easy enough, right? I didn't need to draw those arrows. I didn't need to do whatever. But now let's look at the next one. All right, so now Anna walks 90 meters due east. And then walks 50 meters due north. It's supposed to be a straight line. All right, 50 meters due north. So this is 90, this is 50. Okay, what is her displacement? Well, 
I, you know, I can't, it's not easy to think about those in that situation. So what I need to start doing is figuring out how to, way to add these vectors. If I just said 90 and, and 50, um, then that doesn't quite make sense. I can't add them up in any way. So what I need to do is start representing them graphically so I can build triangles, and triangles can tell me things using Pythagorean theorem and sine cosine tangent. So when we add vectors, uh, how, do we, how do we combine them, uh, the ones that we had before? Uh, we're going to use something called tip to tail. All right, so I have two vectors, A and B. This is, these are examples from the book. If I draw a vector A, it's right here, um, and then I can draw a vector B, but I draw a vector B from, so place the tail of B on the tip of A. So essentially it's like, you know, hey, I started here, I went here, and then I turned and went this way. Okay, so I put the tail of my second vector, whatever value that is, uh, in this case, it's 50 meters north. It's our second value. And I put it on the tip or the end of the first vector. And essentially what happens is this direct line path, right, becomes my displacement. And this is a vector called A plus B. Right, so the result of adding A plus B this is A right here. This is B when I add them together, which means this, then this, and I get what I have here, A plus B. So this brings up the difference between, yeah, um, between physics and math. Okay, So we use a lot of math, that's true. But we have to do it a certain way in order for our physics understanding to come through. So math class over here, all right, math class is always kind of saying, well, you have, you know, an angle A, side, and, you know, then, you know, corsons with side A, angle B, the corsons with side B, and then, you know, C here, All right? If I want to find angle A, then I, using this, then I can find, you know, like tangent and so on, so on, so on. So you have A, Bs, and Cs, right? Now, I mean, I still remember my Pythagorean theorem as, as this, but what we do in physics is we represent, right, we re represent these things a little bit different. We represent our sides of the triangles by arrows, by vectors, right? So we're adding two vectors, three meters east, let's use that as an example, and five meters north. So instead of having, you know, um, instead of having, uh, you know, A, B, you know, A, B, and C, we have vector 1, vector 2, and then the resultant of adding those two vectors together, right? So in this case, you know, we're asking ourselves, okay, we're no longer, you know, the term that we typically use is not angle A, we just say uh, theta, right? Say theta... Um, you know, and then we have the two different sides here. So we have this thing uh, crossover back and forth. A lot of y'all will want to still just draw triangles like this, right? But the idea is that you, you have to break yourself free of that, and you really have to start, you really have to start adding in those arrow tips, okay? Because it signifies to you what that actually is, and it actually makes a big difference uh, with the process and, and how you think about it, okay? So, um, you still use sine, cosine, tangent, everything else like that, and angles, um, but you just got to be, uh, I, I just suggest that you really think, you know, in this more physics term uh, now, and um, and uh, it's kind of stay in that mindset of the stuff on the right versus the uh, the stuff on the left. As a reference on page 18 of the book, there is a good kind of uh, tutorial here to just help you remind you about um, sine, cosine, tangent, Sokotoa, how to solve for, um, you know, angles uh, from that, you know, uh, using the inverse and so on. 
Um, so feel free to look that up as, uh, as a guide. So now we're ready to revisit our initial problem. Uh, Anna walks 90 meters east. Got that. All right, and then 50 meters north. Okay, so I draw my first vector, 90 meters. Got that there in the pink. And then I draw my second vector, starting from the tip of my first vector and going in the direction that it needs to go. All right, this is my uh, 50 meters due north. What is her displacement? The displacement here is this, this end right here. When I added these two displacements together, it was easy when the displacements were like this, right? We had 90 and 50, right? And that just ended up being 140. But the idea is that once I started going like this, right, then things had to change. Right? That was my displacement. So, find the uh, magnitude using Pythagorean theorem. So, what's Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Or in this case, my displacement, whatever. I still use A squared, B squared, and so on. But I say, okay, my C squared, C is what I'm trying to find. Okay? Uh, back that up because it looks like a 3. C is what I'm trying to find. Actually, I'll just zoom on in. Okay, so C is what I'm trying to find. C squared equals A squared. Well, it doesn't matter which one, so I'll just say that's 3 meters squared. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, different problem here. Um, so I'll say that is not 3, but that is uh, 90 meters squared plus the other value, which is 50 meters squared, and that's what my c value is. Uh, so c squared, sorry. Um, so this is 8, 1, 0, 0. And this is 25, so 50 times 50, get that right in my head, 2,500. Okay, now I must add those together and take the square root. So those added together will get me uh, 10,600 meters squared. Take the square root of that. And I get 102.9563, and so on, so on, meters um, there. Well, look at significant figures. They gave me 90 and 50. I'm going to go ahead and assume that they actually meant that some kind of level of precision. So I'll give it two significant figures here. And uh, I'll report this as um, 100 and, um, well, actually, just probably 100 meters or so. Okay. Now, I must give it a direction. 100 meters is not enough. That's just a value. I must give it a direction. So now I have to actually go back to my picture here. And then I have to give it specifically this value of a direction, okay? So, I have to, this is Pythagorean theorem, now I have to look at Sokotoa. I know uh, this value, this value, and this value, so I could actually use any of the so, uh, sine, cosine, or tangent. What I will recommend is try to stick to tangent. Try to stick to tangent. And the reason is, is that I knew this was 90, and I knew this was 50. I then calculated this. Let's say I messed up on my Pythagorean theorem. All right? So let's say this answer was wrong. If I use sine or cosine, um, it will depend on this hypotenuse answer right here. But if I use tangent, it only depends on the values that I was initially given. All right? So it's a little bit 
you know, safer value to use. So I don't mess up two problems. If I mess up, I just mess up one. So I say tangent of theta is equal to my opposite over my adjacent. So this is 50 meters divided by my adjacent 90 meters. So I say tangent of my angle is my opposite 50 meters divided by my adjacent 90 meters. All right, now let me see what that says in my calculator. Okay, so in order to solve for that, I got to uh, kind of correct myself a little bit. So if I'm looking for tangent, you know, theta is equal to 50 divided by 90, right? If I want just theta, I got to do, you know, this inverse tan. So tangent to negative 1, 50, 90, right? And that actually will give me... Uh, a value in degrees, which is what I want, and that degree is 29 degrees, right? Um, and one thing i got to keep track of, and we'll practice this a lot more, is uh, 29 degrees is not enough information. i got to tell you 29 degrees relative to what. Um, and the idea is that if this is east, right here, if this is east, and then this is north, and 29 degrees would be north from east or north of east, all right? So north from east or north of east. So my ultimate answer is 100 meters at 29 degrees north of east. Now, my velocity works in the same way in the fact that it can be represented graphically by vectors. It's a little bit more difficult because... We're talking about adding velocities. It doesn't quite make sense as in adding displacements. As I go here and then there. It, it doesn't quite make as much sense, but uh, there are some situations. One of the prime, ex uh, prime examples is let's say that you have, you're traveling um, uh, 50, uh, sorry, 500 miles per hour in a plane going east. Uh, but the wind is going 200 miles an hour to the west. Uh, so it's obviously, you yeah, two different velocities. It's partially canceling out. You can add those vectors. Uh, so, so since velocity depends on displacement, uh, velocity vectors always point in the same direction as the displacement. So what I see here is that if I keep track of velocity as I go along, Right from here, sorry, keep track of displacement as I go along from here to here to here and so on. If I keep as I keep track of that, I can keep track of that spacing. The interval of time in between each dot right here is the same. Each one is one second apart from the other, and I see that the distance is increasing. Uh, and so, what's velocity? Velocity is distance. Oh sorry, no, the displacement divided by time. All right, so my displacement is increasing between each one of the dots, and the time is staying the same, essentially. So that means my velocity is also increasing. Uh, it also means my velocity is basically the same as my displacement arrows here. All right, so what would Anna's average velocity be if she made the trip in two minutes? Um, so, you know, her velocity, I'm sorry, her displacement was, um, was 100 meters, okay? And if she did that in two minutes, otherwise known as, um, otherwise known as 120 seconds, right, she would get the value of 100 divided by 120 seconds, so 100 divided by 120, right? So her velocity is 0 0.83 meters per second. That would give me um, her speed, sorry. If I wanted her velocity, then I have to add a direction. I'd have to keep, you know, at 29 degrees uh, north of east. And we'll practice that direction finding uh, a little bit later.